All right, good afternoon. Let's get started. So today's lecture is gonna talk about untrusted servers at a high level and how can we build secure systems with an untrusted server. And at some logical sense, this is a continuation of what we talked about last week on how to build messaging systems without also trusting the network or trusting the server. And here we're gonna be seeing, or the reason we're reading this paper uh, is not because Sundra itself is a deployed system, uh, it's a research prototype, but what's going on in this paper, the reason we're excited about it is because Sundra is really addressing a very strong threat model where they're assuming the server could do arbitrarily bad stuff. This is the Byzantine server that the paper talks about. And at the same time, Sundra is trying to build a fairly challenging system on top of this untrusted server. So they're trying to build a pretty faithful file system with users and groups and permissions and uh, concurrent accesses to the same server over the network. So it's a pretty challenging application that they're managing to achieve in this very weak threat model, weak in the sense of they're assuming very little is correct about the server. They're not making strong assumptions about how good the server is gonna do its work. And the paper has pretty powerful techniques that uh, you see show up again and again in decentralized systems. So things like blockchains or uh, decentralized systems that we'll look at later in, the in this class, like T-Base, all use techniques that uh, Sunder uh, describes. So that's sort of the, the backdrop for why we're looking at the paper. Another, I guess, pragmatic reason is that Lab 5, the encrypted file system, is very closely based on Sunder. So hopefully understanding Sunder will help you understand what's going on in Lab 5. So let's get started. Feel free to interrupt as usual. I'm happy to answer questions uh, as we go. Uh, so if anything is unclear, please uh, unmute and interrupt. Um, so to get started, I wanted to draw out the, I think, setting that this uh, paper is trying to address. So they're imagining that there's a whole bunch of user clients out there in the world that want to collaborate on a shared file system. So we all have clients A, B, C maybe, and all these guys are gonna talk to some kind of a file server in the middle here. And the file server is gonna be responsible for storing uh, some shared files. Think uh, Dropbox or Google Drive or any of these network storage systems that are available today in the cloud. And in this case, you know, they'll use some fairly standard probably RPC protocol to interact between the client and the server. Uh, but the challenging thing here, the thing that's really different from what Dropbox and Google Drive are doing today is that we'd like to provide some semblance of security for these clients, even when this server is Byzantine. So what the paper, and I mean by Byzantine server behavior, is that anything goes. We're, the server could do arbitrarily bad stuff. So uh, the way you should think of this Byzantine behavior is that you know, the adversary controls the server completely. They have root access on the machine. They can send any packet they want. Uh, they can monitor the network, add this file server, and so on. Uh, so pretty strong model in terms of what the attacker can do. Um, and even more so, uh, the attacker could collude with bad users. So if you have a shared folder that you're sharing between your group of friends and another user D here, maybe D is not being very good about keeping his computer secured. So if the attacker breaks into D's computer, now all of a sudden the file server and D could both sort of collude together and attempt to uh, somehow undermine our security. And despite all of this, our goal is to make sure that A, B, and C get a consistent, secure view of this file system to the extent possible. So the only approximate limitation on the attacker here is that he cannot break crypto. So if we have signatures or encryption, the bad guy can't just conjure up a fake signature without access to the cryptographic keys. So it seems like a fairly weird threat model, if you might think, but the reason we're excited about it is that really it's covering a large number of possible real scenarios. So this is sort of, you know, subsumes 
many real attacks. So one way you might think about it is that, suppose you had a real file server like Dropbox or Google Drive or NFS file servers. The file server itself might have software bugs in it, buffer overflows. Well, that just falls under our Byzantine threat model. If the bad guy guesses the root password on the file server, that's also just a particular example of a Byzantine server. Same thing if the server itself has been physically taken by the bad guy or someone breaks into the data center or someone bribes the administrator of this you know, cloud provider. All these things fall under the Byzantine threat model, which is why we consider it in sort of this slightly roundabout way. So that's the setting. And what do you mean by security in this context of a Byzantine server? Well, as usual, you could imagine lots of properties you might want out of your file system, even though the file server is malicious or Byzantine in this way. Uh, an easy thing you might worry about is perhaps confidentiality. So it would be cool if the file server could not read your confidential files. So lab five involves you guys building a little bit of a confidentiality setup on top of a Sunder-like network file system. Um, another thing you might worry about, and what this paper mostly falls, worries about, is integrity. So suppose that you have a whole bunch of public data, but it's critical that the bad guy cannot corrupt it. So you might not care about as much about confidentiality, uh, but it's really critical that the bad guy cannot uh, inject arbitrary data into your high integrity set of files. Uh, and this is really what the paper is really focusing on, integrity. Turns out to be a pretty hard problem and to some extent isolated from confidentiality. And you can see this is an academic research paper. They're really hammering on this one problem of integrity. And uh, of course, in practice, you probably want to worry about confidentiality and other things too. Uh, but as an intellectual sort of exercise, this is all about how do you do integrity? It turns out to be very tricky to do correctly. And another property you might worry about is things like availability. So can the user keep getting access to their files even though the server is malicious? In Sunder's case, there is no real availability story. If the server goes down or if the attacker doesn't want to talk to a user, that's it, the user is out of luck. The bad guy is going to be able to mount a denial of service attack in this sense. Uh, but there's more recent uh, techniques. Uh, many of the blockchains uh, worry about uh, availability in, uh, and avoiding a central entity that can uh, bring down the whole system in terms of availability. So we're not going to focus on that much uh, on availability. Sunder doesn't really have a strong story there. Uh, but the focus is really going to be all about integrity. How do you prevent the bad guy from corrupting the files? And the motivating example for integrity in this paper is really source code. So imagine you have some open source project uh, and you have a team of developers all collaborating on the source code. And it will be really bad if your source code was stored on a compromised server and the bad guy can change your source code. And this actually happened a couple of times. It's really quite a serious issue when it happens. So the paper mentions Debian, which is a pretty popular Linux distribution, had a compromise of its uh, source code uh, repository. And uh, it required quite a bit of careful auditing and trying to figure out what did the bad guy do? Are we sure the bad guy didn't put some backdoor into one of our source code files? And then it happened again, actually. So uh, SourceForge, uh, which is a popular sort of GitHub-like entity before GitHub existed, uh, also had a compromise of its servers uh, a couple of years after this paper was published. And again, this thing was down for several days or maybe weeks, if I remember correctly, while the operators tried to figure out what the hell happened, how do we recover? Uh, and then it happened again to Canonical, which is the entity operating Ubuntu uh, a year or two ago. And again, their account was compromised and uh, in some ways, the bad guy could have, again, modified source code. It seems really important to get right. Um, so pretty serious problem in practice. So just for the purpose of this lecture, uh, I'm going to cook up a little bit of a uh, you know, toy scenario for us to discuss. And the scenario I want to discuss is similar to what the paper proposes about uh, developing source code in a shared repository. But you know, we'll have a team of Zubar developers so we have a whole bunch of devs working on uh, the Zubar application from the lab exercises you guys have been working on. 
And the toy scenario I want to propose is that, let's say we want to make Zubar real. So we want to integrate it with MIT's accounts and we want to allow users, instead of transferring Zubars, to really transfer tech cash, real money. So how might this work? Well, we got the Zubar source code stored in our file server. So you, developer A, his job is going to be to add user authentication. So he modifies auth.py to log in using uh, you know, MIT certs. So A modifies auth.py. Now user logins are real MIT accounts instead of these first come first serve Zubar accounts. That's all pretty good. Now developer B comes along and says, well, now that these accounts are real, I will change the bank code, bank.py, and I will link it with tech cash. And this might not be a disastrous plan because B sees that, oh, well, A already made these accounts real and maybe A did a good job. So only real MIT students and uh, staff can log into this website with their MIT certs. And then another user C comes along and uh, he packages this up. So says, okay, great, we have these two features. Let me package it up and ship it and you know, deploy it on a real website. So stuff happens in practice, right? Like teams collaborate on source code, these guys through GitHub, but all the same things happen, right? Like you have these various features and uh, there's several undesirable outcomes that could, you know, we, we could end up with if the server is untrusted and compromised. So for example, it would be just an outright disaster if C went to package up our web application and the server just gave it some other garbage code. So if the server can give C arbitrary source code to package up and deploy, we've lost. The bad guy can give us any fake code he wants uh, and we'll deploy it on our real application or C will get tricked into doing that. But a more subtle issue that Sunder tries to address is that maybe the bad guy is gonna sort of somehow pick and choose and it would be a disaster if we deployed change B using tech cache without A's change that uses MIT search for users. Because then anyone would be able to sign up for an account on Zubar, but then transfer real tech cache. This is not what B intended, of course, because B thought, ah, MIT search were already there. But it would be disastrous if our file system didn't provide this property. And we'll sort of look at this property of making sure that B's change cannot show up without A's change in the deployed source code that C observes. That makes sense? Questions about this sort of toy scenario? We're gonna to try to go through this scenario several times in the context of various straw man designs that Sander has here. All right, so if there's no questions, let me start with a naive design for this file server in the middle and we'll see how we might try to achieve integrity for our file system and we'll see how it lines up with our toy Zubar uh, scenario here. All right, so I'll keep my clients. The clients are the same, but I'm, what I'm gonna describe is kind of a naive version of the server in the middle and a particular naive plan for how that server might try to, or how the system might guard against a server being Byzantine. So here is a naive plan. So here's a, our file server. It's got a file system. So there's a root directory probably. And then we have our file for, you know, auth.py in our Zubar source code. I don't know what's in there. Let me say, say a bunch of A's. And then we have our file for bank.py. And this thing has a bunch of B's. So this is the shared file system. How do we make sure that the file server cannot corrupt these files arbitrarily? We care about integrity. There's nothing secret in the source code. Well, a fairly reasonable thought might be to sign these files. So let's try to do this. So let's give every user a public private key pair. And for now, let's imagine the users all know each other's keys. So all of our users here know the public key of A, the public key of B, and the public key of C. Everyone knows this stuff. 
So now what's going to happen is that we'll have the first developer, A, when he modifies auth.py, he's going to sign it. He's going to sign with the secret key of A the contents of AAA. That's the data I'm saving. And then when user B goes to store his changes to bank.py, well, he's also going to sign it. So that's the straw man design I'm proposing. So this is a good plan. Well, one thing you might imagine is, uh, well, you might want to know is, uh, could a server fake the contents of auth.py or bank.py now? Well, I think these signatures are actually pretty good at that. So on the positive side, server can know, cannot fake the data. So by fake data, I mean, if uh, the server wants to just inject arbitrary Python code into auth.py, the server can't really do this because the clients are gonna be expecting a signature on the contents of the file and the server can't cook that up. The server doesn't have the secret keys for these users. That makes sense? Questions? So how about other problems? Anyone have ideas as to what a bad guy might be able to do despite these signatures? They could mix different versions of different files together. So they yeah, have so there's a whole bunch of things that are basically not constrained by these signatures. So what you're describing by versions is, I think, uh, you know, inconsistent versions. Let me say that here. So suppose that auth.py used to have some old contents, A0, and, B had B0, and the bank by had B0. Well, the server, when C goes to deploy the app, it could give the old signed version of auth.py, but the new signed version of the bank code. There's nothing really that ties the two files together in any sense. And the previous signed version of auth.py would have probably been something like signed with the secret key of A, of the old data, A0. That is still a perfectly good cryptographic signature, even though a new one exists somewhere in the world. So there's nothing in this design that really ties the versions together. Absolutely good point. Uh, another weakness is actually, there's uh, nothing that actually that ties the data to the file name. So in this case, user B just signs the contents of file B, but the signature doesn't actually say that this data goes with bank.py. So a malicious server could actually respond when C tries to fetch auth.py. The server could say, well, yeah, auth.py contains this stuff. And by the way, here's a signature from B saying it put it there. So we have to be a little bit more careful, of course. Uh, uh, this is actually a thing that we can fix pretty easily here. We should just append auth.py to the thing we're signing. And here we should append bank.py to make it clear that this is the data that goes with this file and then the server can't flip them around. Another problem of course is that, you know, not only can you get inconsistent versions, but maybe a similar property, uh, uh, you know, might not get latest. So even if they were consistent, uh, the server could accept the right to auth.py and bank.py and then when C asks, it could just give old versions of everything. So as you can see, this per file signature isn't really working out super well for us. And maybe the last thing I'll sort of point out about this design that it doesn't do well is uh, the server, I guess what I'll say is that he can hide files because there's nothing here that authenticates the directory itself. So when C asks the server, hey, give me bank.py, the server could say, hey, sorry, that's just like not a file that exists, too bad. And there's nothing here that allows the client C to be convinced one way or another. The directory is not authenticated in any way at all. Make sense? Questions about this straw man plan. Uh, hopefully this illustrates why sort of signing individual files is tricky or insufficient and what are the challenges we're seeing here. All right, so that's a straw man. Doesn't work out so well. Doesn't work out so well in particular for our 
Zubar scenario because the bad guy can pick and choose. He can deploy the new bank code and the old authentication code, which is exactly the problem we were trying to solve. So better than nothing, but we'd like to have a stronger guarantee in terms of integrity for our files. So here comes in sort of the big idea from the Sundra paper of how to actually make sense of this. And one thing you should take away from that straw man of signing each file individually is that file system requires more elaborate things to be signed. We got to sign which version goes with which other version. We got to sign the contents of the directory. We got to sign what's the latest thing versus now what's stale. And it's quite tricky to wrap your head around all the things that might go wrong in the file system and consequently all the things that you now got to sign. So we started writing down some list of things that could go bad, but it's not an exhaustive list. So the big idea in Sunder, it's almost like a way of thinking about the problem is log operations at the server. Instead of trying to maintain this file system with complicated structures of directories that have dependencies, one file's gotta be as fresh as another file. That seems tricky to reason about. The big idea here is don't try to reason about that. Think about a log of operations. So what's going on on the server in Sunder? It's really a log of things that are either basically a fetch by a client or a modify operation trying to either fetch some part of the file system or modify it. And this log is gonna look, you know, kind of like, you know, let, me, let me draw out some example here. We have some prefix uh, and uh, maybe the first thing that happens is in our example, we get a modification. So we modify auth.py and the log says who's doing it. So it's A, user A is modifying auth.py at this point in the log. And the server itself doesn't really have to understand to a first approximation what this log means. The server just has to keep adding entries to this log. There's a little bit more to it than that, but we'll get to it. Um, and then the clients are really on the hook for figuring out what the hell does this log mean? But the nice thing here is that the boundary between clients and the server is now this very simple idea of a log. And that's much easier to understand how to get that consistent and right, as opposed to getting a complicated file system structure consistent and right. So let me describe a little bit more detail what's going on in this log. So every log has something either being fetched or modified by a client. So here, client user A is modifying auth.py. And every log entry is gonna come with a signature that covers, of course, its entry, but also all the other entries preceding this entry. So the signature actually covers sort of from here, going back to the very beginning of the log. That's at least logically what is gonna get signed by every log entry. So what I'm gonna describe here is the straw man design from the Sandra paper that uh, is inefficient, but it's really, that's the crisp way of thinking about this problem that's super helpful. So suppose we have this log, suppose A has modified off the PY. Now some other client wants to actually download it. So here we have, you know, maybe client B. Client B wants to modify bank.py. So how do they do it? Client B needs to like get the old version of bank.py perhaps to modify it, figure out what else is going in the file system. So here's the workflow. First, you download the log. And you basically get the whole copy of the log uh, from the server, including the whole history and hopefully the latest version. And then once you've downloaded the log, your job is gonna be sort of twofold to check that this is a good log. First, you gotta verify the signatures. So every, si every element in the log has to be signed by the user who claims to have put that entry there. And the signature better cover the whole log going back in time. So that ensures sort of the server didn't tamper with the contents of any log entry or with the whole structure of the log going back. It's consistent linear log. And then you gotta make sure that your latest element is there. 
So each client probably had some changes back here in the history. And when a client wants to download the log from the server, it's important not only that all the signatures are good, but that this client's last operation is still in this log history. So this is what's gonna actually ensure, we'll sort of talk about this in more detail coming up, but this is what's really gonna hold the server accountable to make sure that it's not forgetting this client's latest operation. It has to be in this log history. And in order to do this, of course, the client has to locally store its own latest change, its own latest operation from the log so that it can look for it uh, when it needs to do something next. All right, so we've, we've downloaded the log, we've checked that all the signatures look good and that the log is consistent with what we last did. The way to think of it is that what we last did must be a prefix and there's maybe some more stuff that happened after we last touched the file system. And then the plan sort of splits into two phases, if you will. One is now that we have this log that we've checked and made sense of, we're gonna actually interpret it. What I mean by interpreting the log is that we'll take all these log operations from the beginning of time going forward and we'll figure out what do these mean in terms of a file system state. So we'll basically construct what is the logical file system this talks about? Well, there's probably the root directory, some files here, off py, bank py, maybe there's a subdirectory with something, who knows? So the client will reconstruct the file system tree that logically would have been cooked up if you did all those operations in order. And these operations better be pretty deterministic so that clients can unambiguously figure out what file system does this log represent. And then once you've interpreted the file system and checked that these operations all make sense and are all allowed on the file system, then you're gonna actually figure out what you wanna do. Now that you have a file system, you can do your operation. And uh, this file system tree might help you figure out what the operation is, like modify bank py to edit it in some way. And then you log your new thing to this uh, server history. So then you basically append to the log and then you sign. And finally, you upload your entry into the server. So in our example here, client B checked out the state, found bank.py, decided how he wants to edit it, appends this edit and signs. And now I'm gonna use a different color. Um, the log now is gonna contain this new operation from user B that is a modify of bank.py from B and there's a new signature. And again, this signature is gonna cover the whole log, including this new operation, but also everything going back to the beginning of time. So that's what's going on in this straw man design. In Sunder, each it's like horribly inefficient as you can imagine. So uh, that's easy to sort of complain about here. And we'll look at how to make this more efficient, uh, but the really cool thing is that it's now pretty clear what kind of a property we need on the log at the server and how to ensure it. We just need to make sure that all these elements in the log appear one after another in some very agreed upon order between all the clients and the server can't mess with this. All the clients see the same view. As long as we ensure that, then we get any property you might care about about the file system magically is given to you you don't have to worry about how you assign directories and consistency between files and all this stuff. It just falls out of thinking about the world in terms of uh, this history log. That makes sense. Any questions about this straw man design from Sunder? All right, so yeah, you had a question? Yeah, in order to decrypt the previous logs, how does the client B get the public keys from? Ah, excellent question. So first off, let me just correct you. Presumably you mean how to check the signature. So there's no encryption going on here. This is just integrity. All the file contents are actually public and we don't care if the server knows what's in our source code of Zubar. It's not a terribly exciting application. 
but uh, what we do care about is the server doesn't corrupt it. So we need the signature and we need to figure out how is the server gonna, sorry, how is the client here gonna figure out what public key should be used to sign each element in the log? So of course we have a public key distribution problem. So every client in the straw man design I presented on sort of in this naive thing I presented uh, before this, I just hand waved and said, all the clients know each other's public keys. But it's probably not true in practice or not true to begin with. Sunver has to make this true. Got to distribute the keys somehow. And also you might actually have some users that are not authorized to modify the, your whole source code. Uh, so in the Zubar example, this is easy enough. You know, it's a small application, but suppose you had a serious shared repository of source code and maybe only some developers are allowed to touch the user authentication code. That's really critical. So we better get experts to modify it only and other users can't touch it. But then there's plenty of other features like you know, playing games on top of the Zubar thing and who knows what. And maybe there's plenty of other developers that can add a new game on top of our Zubar platform and add other features but can't touch the user authentication code. So indeed, I think key distribution is a huge problem and figuring out how to get the public key that we should expect a signature from is critical. And just to say what the precise problem is here, the log actually says which user claims to have signed this operation. So you could imagine the log actually contains the public key of A right there. So every log entry says which public key of a user is signing that operation. So that sort of trivially answers the question of, oh yeah, well, which public key should you use to check the signature? Well, it's the one that's right there, it tells you, PKA. But then we got to answer the much harder question is, is PKA a sensible key to be signing this operation? So that's really the key distribution problem we have is that the log says, oh, PKA modified auth.py, PKB modified bank.py. All these signatures check out, but is PKB the attacker or is PKB a user that's allowed to modify bank.py? So here's a very actually clever plan that Sunder has for key distribution. And the idea is sort of, I'll describe it in three steps if you will. So first, every file has an owner. And this owner is basically a public key. You can think of right now in Unix, every file is owned by some kind of a user ID or a user account. And then that user is able to read and write that file. Other users perhaps cannot. So in Sunder, every file owner ends up being sort of corresponding to a public key. The way they do this in Sunder is that there's actually a table stored in the root directory that says user ID seven, which might be the actual owner of the sign node, corresponds to this public key. But for simplicity, you can just think of a file has an owner, which is a public key. All right, so that seems sensible enough. We basically replaced Unix user IDs with public keys in some way. Then what we're gonna do is actually figure out who owns every file. That turns out to be surprisingly easy to do. So you basically, you specify the owner when you create a file or you change the owner. So when you create a file, you gotta figure out who should own the file. Or maybe you create it and it's owned by you by default, but then you can change the ownership or change the permissions on the file so that other users can access it. So then you're running the ch own command in Unix and you're setting the permissions on the file to change the owner to a different public key, different user. So again, we're sort of deriving this ownership of a file from how the file system is getting constructed along the way. And the final idea of how you bootstrap this whole plan is that every client must know the root public key, the root directory's public key. What I mean by this is that this is the super user key that Sandra talks about. Um, when a file system is created, what that means is that there's a root directory and the root directory is empty, but the root directory needs to be owned by someone. And that's the public key of the super user that sort of defines this whole file system tree. And the server could of course have multiple of these guys, but every logical Sunder file system has a single owner of the root. And that owner of the root 
gets to share their file system with other users. The way they do this is they create subdirectories or they create files and they change the owner of those subdirectories or users to specific buddies of them, of theirs, uh, by specifying the public key of who owns that subdirectory or file. And then that now answers the question of which public key should be allowed to issue up any particular modification. So the way to think of it is that what's going on is that Sunder is trying to maintain this property of file system integrity. So at every point, the structure of the file system is completely intact. We know what's going on. And this allows us to derive the public keys by basically saying the file system itself tells us what public key to use for any given file. It's the owner of the file. And here's the cool thing, that in turn sort of allows us to maintain future file system integrity. So there's a cycle between sort of, you know, you had file system integrity at one moment, then that tells you what public key can change any file or directory. And then because you know what public key can change any file or directory, that lets you authenticate the next change to the file system. And that gives you file system integrity at the next step. There's this very clever observation in Sunder that allows us to sort of bootstrap this loop between file system integrity and uh, getting the public keys of all the users uh, set up correctly. And then sort of the entry point into this clever loop is this thing. So in order to use a Sunder file system, the client has to be told the public key of the guy that created the file system at the root. That makes sense? Yep, thank you. Cool. I have right. a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so in this situation, uh, what you have is each file uh, has the owner, the public key. Yep. But what if you wanna, like multiple people wanna modify the same file now? Now, yeah, so this is, yeah, so absolutely. So this is a little bit naive uh, in the sense that uh, I sort of pretended like there's a single user owning a given file. And the way Sunder like, gets around this limitation is that they have this notion of a group. So a group is effectively a list of public keys. So a file could be owned either by a single public key, so just one user, or a file could be owned by a group, so a list of public keys. And then the rule is, anyone in the list of those public keys of the group is allowed to modify that file or directory. I see. Other questions about this public key setup plan? All right. So let's talk about sort of what's going on in this design and what, why we're doing certain things here. Um, so one is that it's really important in the straw man design that each log entry is signed or the signature covers both the log entry itself and the whole history going back. So this is, if you will, the main thing that distinguishes the straw man from the really naive plan I presented before. And the really naive plan we presented before, what was basically going on is we were signing each entry separately. And by separately signing these entries, we gave the server the freedom to pick and choose which entries it reveals to a client that tries to read the state of the system. But because we sign the whole history going back, this ensures that if a server reveals this change to a client, it must also reveal this earlier change. So let's step through this example. So suppose uh, we had developer A modified auth.py and then developer B modified bank.py. And now developer C comes along and wants to download the contents of all the files and package it up for deployment. So what happens if the server tries to hide the change to auth.py? Well, if it wants to send the new bank code to C, 
it's going to send this log entry with this signature. But the signature covers the history, including the previous change to auth.py. So if the server hides this from client C, then client C is going to say the signature doesn't match because I'm looking at this log, then there's nothing here, and then immediately this operation from B. The signature was on something else. So client C is going to immediately notice that something's up with this log and this operation just cannot check out, will not verify as being a correct signature, correctly signed, unless this previous operation is also seen by the client. This is the really cool property about signing this sort of log is that you get all kinds of consistency guarantees almost for free out of a system built on top of this log construction. Does that make sense? Questions? Uh, all right. Have... Yeah, go ahead. Um, so you cannot take out any log entries from in between, but you could still serve a lo uh, stale log. That's right, yeah. So we'll talk about this actually in a second. Uh, actually, this is like uh, exactly the right thing to talk about, which is that um, Sunder also logs fetch operations. So what could happen, let's imagine that uh, this was the only story going on, that we only log modifications. What could go wrong? So let me erase this client down here, which was our example of client B generating this change. And let me now talk about how client C might try to download the contents of all the files. So what will happen is that first client C goes to fetch auth.py. So we'll you know, somehow fetch auth.py, let's say. And in a naive scheme that didn't log the fetch operation, what the server could do is just say, well, ah, oh, well, here's a perfectly good prefix of the log. It'll take sort of this chunk and send it to the client when the client wants to fetch auth.py. This prefix on the left, the dot, 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 was presumably correctly signed and it's got neither this change nor that change. But it's a perfectly good prefix of the log. It's all well signed. The client is gonna say, great, all right. All the checks are gonna pass because the log is signed and C's latest operation is presumably in there. Because whatever C did, it must have been in this prefix because here we just have A and B. C didn't do anything yet. So in this case, C is gonna be tricked into thinking auth.py is old. No problem. So far, it all checks out. But then when C goes to fetch bank.py, the server could say, oh, well, good that you asked. Something happened in the meantime. <laughs> in particular, here, you read it back here, but now that you want bank.py, it turns out that your buddy A and B did this combination of operations. A did this, B did this, so you get a new bank.py now. And this also looks totally legit because it's as if while C was reading the files, other people were concurrently modifying them. So C just had a race condition, if you will. That's sort of the way you might justify why this isn't, why we're sort of seeing this behavior. You could imagine it actually was real. But this is the problem that you get if you don't put the fetch operations into the log. It's a little bit counterintuitive because fetch is just a read. So why should you be writing down a record of every read? But the benefit of logging the fetches in the log is that it forces the server to establish a single unambiguous order in which the fetches and modifies happen. So here we're not logging the fetches and the server gets to sort of choose, you know, how much, which prefix it wants to reveal. The server doesn't get to pick and choose like, oh, I want to give you this, but not this. That would be disallowed. But the server can sort of, you know, reveal a part of the history not the latest stuff. How come that doesn't violate the Byzantine assumption? Because couldn't the server just choose not to fetch? I mean, so, not to log okay, the so fetch. This, uh, sorry, the Byzantine assumption is the server can do anything. And this is indeed a case of anything. 
Uh, what this does violate, of course, is that this doesn't give us the guarantee that we want it to. So indeed, the, the Sunder straw man that the paper describes does a little bit more than what I've written on the board, which is that the straw man logs the fetch operations into the log as well. So when C goes to fetch auth.py, it actually writes a record into the log saying, I am fetching auth.py and I am C and here I am signing the fact that I just fetched auth.py. And the reason that this helps, the reason it's important to log the fetches is that they help us to guard against this Byzantine server and ensure that the server doesn't get to play this game of revealing sort of a selectively old version of the state and then being able to catch us up later. Uh, so when you say server logs, you mean the client has to add the fetch operation? To yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. So what I mean is that indeed, yeah. So the, very much like we had this diagram before where if you wanted to make a change to the file system, you send the server a new entry to add to the log that's signed. The same thing happens when you're fetching as well. And in particular, two things happen. The client sort of generates this L entry in the log and it both sends it to the server so that if the server wants to play along, it'll actually stick it in the log there. But also the client remembers it locally as its own last thing it did. And that ensures that from that point on, the server can't lie and say, oh, well, actually, sorry, your read happened earlier here, or actually now it happened there. The fact that you signed this operation at a very specific point in the log commits the server to not reorder your read from this point onwards. So just to maybe connect the dots, in the straw man design that we had down here where we were not putting the fetches in the log, our system was vulnerable to an adversary that would give us an old version of auth.py, but a new version of bank.py, which is exactly the problem we wanted to avoid. But if we log the fetches, then this cannot happen. That's a really cool thing. So in the normal course of operations, if everything is working well, then C is gonna log its read of auth.py here. And then it will also log the read of bank.py over here and also sign it. And now we have a complete history of what happened. A modified, B modified, then C read auth.py and C read bank.py. And this all adds up. That's sort of how we want it to work if the server is not trying to uh, compromise our integrity. But the cool thing is that now the server can't lie to us. So for example, once the server commits us into this position, it must give us the most recent auth.py and the most recent bank.py. There's no alternative because if it tries, if we fetch auth.py here and sign this operation, and then we fetch bank.py and the server says, oh, no, 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 it's actually back here. We'll say that's nonsense. Our latest change is not in the history you're giving us. We know, C knows that it was reading off the py this position in the log. It will not accept something shorter from the server as a history. And if it has to get this full version, then well, again, this other change is also gonna be in there. It's all consistent. That makes sense? Other questions about this uh, history-based design, straw man? So the one, now sort of comes the, the you know, quite a subtlety in uh, Sanders' design, which is that they don't achieve perfect consistency. So they have this notion of perfect consistency that they call fetch modify consistency. And what that says is that well, we'd like it to be the case that every time you fetch, you observe the last modify. And it turns out you can't get this. Not in their model of the world, at least. So let me draw out the property or like why that's going on and what they are able to achieve. So uh, here's the property. This is the fork consistency business that uh, the paper talks about. And uh, what's going on there is that our model of the world is that the clients only talk to the server. Or at least the base model. 
So here we have a server log that the server maintains. And here I'll talk about sort of more abstract things like, okay, we have a log and we have some entries. Let's say we have like A and B, C, D, whatever else. And the clients, here we have client A, they operate by, as you remember, downloading the log and then uploading and then doing this. So if that's your sort of view of the world, that's your sort of portal through which you see everything, then turns out you can't get strict fetch modify consistency. And the way to imagine it is that um, you have another client over here, it also downloads the log and uploads changes and so on. From each client's perspective, we're gonna ensure all kinds of guarantees that we were talking about before. The file system is all correct and consistent with respect to A's view and also with respect to B's view. But what can happen is the server can sort of play this forking attack on the clients. That's quite a difficult thing to defend against. So what, what basically happens is that instead of maintaining one log, what the server does is actually starts maintaining multiple logs. So at some point the server might say, ah, I'll pretend like there's two universes. I will take this log and sort of rep reproduce it up to a point. Like here we have A, B, and then new stuff happens. Now we have X, now we have Y. And what has to be the case is that uh, client B must never have seen these changes C and D over here. So basically there used to be a single coherent history, A and B happened, everyone agreed on that. And at that point, the server sort of created two copies of itself. One copy that only talks to A and never talks to B and a different copy, the green guy here on the board at the bottom, this guy only talks to B and never talks to A. So in this split brain sort of view of the world, A thinks that everything is fine. For some reason, B is not writing anything, but as far as A can tell, everything is all great. And the same thing for B down here. It might be making changes. So I'll say this comes from B, B keeps modifying stuff. And these changes up here must be happening from A, because they cannot be from B. But the whole world basically gets split into these two forks. And the clients cannot determine that this happened if their only view of the world is through interacting with this one untrusted server. There's no way we can force this untrusted server, at least in this model, to do anything stronger, deal with this forking attack. That makes sense? Questions about this sort of fork consistency model. So I should say, right, like this definitely is weaker than fetch modify. But what the paper argues is that it's sort of unavoidable. And this is sort of the strongest you could possibly get if your model doesn't make any additional assumptions. So if your only model is client stuff to the server and that's it, you're stuck with fork consistency. It must be possible for the server to fork. But the cool thing is that fork consistency is actually pretty strong, if you will. So what I mean by this is that Within each client's view, the server doesn't get to corrupt the file system in any way. It's really as if A was alone in the universe and B was alone in the universe. And it's a little bit more general than this, right? Like these forking attacks don't require the server present each client with its own copy of the file system state. The server gets to almost logically partition the users. So we might have a bunch of clients over here. We might have B, C, and D. These guys are all seeing the bottom fork. And maybe we have A, X, and Y. These guys are all seeing the top fork. And they'll all keep thinking that, yeah, we got our own little island here and we got our own little island at the bottom. So this is what's going on in fork consistency is that uh, quite difficult to, um, reconcile these forks. Does that make sense?
questions about this forking attack and what's going on. All right, so one thing we could talk about now is what do you do about forking attacks? So one perspective is that Sunder's goal is to allow clients to enforce at least fork consistency. So the server can't play any games that violates fork consistency. But then we'd like to be able to eventually detect these forks. It seems a little bit damaging. Uh, I should say that fork consistency would be okay for our Zubar scenario, because in this fork consistency view of the world, if we have our developers modifying auth.py and bank.py, and then a different user deploying the code, there's never a situation when the deployed code is garbage, because it must be a valid code from some point in the past from some fork. And if we ever deploy this bank.py change, we must also deploy the auth.py change. So fork consistency seems sufficient for the Zubar toy scenario that I put up. Um, but you might wanna nonetheless be able to detect these forks. And the cool thing about Sunder is that it actually allows clients to do this as long as they go to some way, in some way outside of this model of only talking to the server. So there's basically two plans that the paper puts forward for how do you detect out of bound, or sorry, detect forks. And there's really sort of these two plans. One is you could have out of bound communication. So what you could have is if you are a user up here and you suspect or you wanna know, is your buddy forked from you or not? You could just send them a message over the network or email or meet them in person. But however you want, you could sort of exchange a message between two users and the users can basically compare notes on where, where, what's going on in the log. And the thing that they really just have to compare is each user can send their most recent log operation to their buddy. And if A sees the most recent change from B and B sees the most recent change from A, then they must be on the same fork. The way to think of it is that each change, so when B sends its latest change to A, each change, if you remember, has a signature that covers not just the change, but the whole prefix going back in time. So if A sees the most recent change from B, that means it also sees the whole prefix before the most recent thing B did. That's basically like everything that B is seeing, A is seeing. And similarly, if B sees the most recent change that A did, the same thing holds. B is seeing the view of the file system as if A is seeing it. That's the really cool thing in uh, Sunder is that even though the system has a slightly weaker fork consistency property, it's actually quite easy to add an assumption or some model like this that allows the users to detect forks. And the other really cool property about Sunder is that even though the server can fork these users into two different universes, the server can never rejoin them. So once a server mounts one of these forking attacks, that's it. The server has no way to cover up its tracks effectively. This forking attack is present by virtue of having two different histories that diverge. Clients will never modify old entries in a history and sign them. So if you ever see a history that agrees here, agrees here, but then disagrees here, it means the server did something funny. And this persists forever onwards. So clients in this universe at the bottom will never accept a log from the top universe as being valid because it doesn't contain their latest change and vice versa. So once the server mounts a forking attack, it's there in the cryptographic structure of all these signed messages and it's reasonably easy to detect if the clients can communicate out of band. 
Any questions about this sort of detecting forking attacks through comparing out of band histories? Yeah, um, I was wondering if you, can you have a regular time interval where you basically make all the clients compare their versions of the log and couldn't that insist, like couldn't that ensure better than for consistency? Yeah, so there's this other technique that the paper proposes, which they call this timestamp box. I think that's the terminology they use. And the idea is roughly what you're describing, although it turns out you can actually leverage Sunder in a slightly more clever way. Uh, so instead of saying, oh, you, you guys have to compare notes every five minutes and like do this every five minutes, what you could do is have a separate service that the paper calls a timestamp box, let's call it T, that sits over here on the right. And every five minutes, it just touches a file. What it means to touch a file is that, let's say it's like, writes the current time into that file's data. So what this means is that the timestamp box will place a modification in some history every five minutes. So let's say it is on the top fork here. So here's the operation from T signed by the timestamp box T. And uh, this operation is, I don't know, from now and then more time happens. Here's another operation from T and they keep going. And the way that this helps deal with forking attacks is that we're gonna trust, our, here, the assumption about the timestamp box is that we're gonna trust the timestamp box isn't gonna be forking itself. So timestamp box is trying to be honest. So what this means is that the server might be Byzantine and might fork into two universes, but the server doesn't have the power to create two clones of the timestamp box because the timestamp box is a separate entity and it's honest, that's the assumption. What that means is that because the timestamp box is this one thing, it's not two of them, then the timestamp box will only sign messages on one fork because the timestamp box is just another Sundra client. If it's on one fork, it will never accept a different fork. So what this means is that if you're seeing messages from the timestamp box, it means that you're on the same fork as the timestamp box is seeing. And if you have a group of users that are all wanting to make sure they're all on the same fork or they're all consistent with one another, all they have to do is they have to watch for timestamps from this timestamp server to appear in the log. If these timestamps are appearing, then this means that all the users seeing the timestamp are all in the same fork because the sort of property of being in the same fork is transitive. So you don't even have to have users do all these pairwise comparisons. They can just all watch for the timestamp box to periodically write something to a file. Now, the one sort of subtle downside to this timestamp box is that if you don't see this entry from the timestamp box, you don't really know quite what's going on. So if you see the timestamp entry, you're good. Or what it means that maybe there's lots of other forks out there, you don't know about them, but you're in the same fork as the timestamp box. And so is anyone else that sees the timestamps. If you don't see the timestamp, you don't really know what's going on. Maybe you're in the bottom fork and there's a whole other universe that you don't see where the timestamp box is working. Another possibility is that the timestamp box crashed and it's just not working at all. Another possibility is the server is blocking the timestamp box from doing anything. So it's a little bit hard to know what it means that you're not seeing the timestamps but the positive works well. If you see the timestamps, things are actually working pretty well. Does that make sense? Other questions about for consistency? Uh, yeah, one more question. So yeah. um, assumptions do you make about how, what uh, happens when the user's permissions change or something like this, their access to and how does that affect yeah, so it's certainly possible for file permissions to change. Um, so if you recall, the file owner is basically the public key that's allowed to write to it. So if I wanna change the ownership of a file to say, well, it used to be that user A could write to it, 
I'll change the owner of the file to me, so A can no longer write to it. What this means is that in my fork, wait, let me step back. If there are no forks, this works great. I change the owner of the file and A's public key is no longer the owner of the file. So A can no longer post changes to the log that modify the file. If A were to post such a change, the clients would reject this saying, this is not a sensible log. A is just not allowed to sign that operation to modify the file. They're not the owner. Now in the presence of forking, changing permissions has a slightly more subtle meaning. What it means for me to change the permission on a file is that on my fork, that user can no longer write to the file. Because on my fork, I am now the owner of that file. But there could exist another fork where my change permission operation never took place. And A remains the owner of the file. It's like an alternate universe where I never change the permissions and everything keeps working. Now, fork consistency ensures that I will never observe that bizarre universe. And similarly, those users that, are, that think A is still the owner will never observe my universe where I'm the owner. But uh, it's true that what it means to change the owner of a file is that everyone that, are, that saw my change owner will now agree that I'm the owner. It doesn't mean that everyone will observe this though, if that makes some sense. Other questions? All right, so hopefully this gave you some sense of this fork consistency property that we're getting out of Sunder. So this log idea, pretty good, has this one corner case that you can't really avoid, this forking attack, but there are some ways that you can get around it by assuming some out of band communication or that assuming the existence of an honest timestamping box that you trust to exist there and write periodically. All right, so that's the Sundra straw man. Pretty good idea to think of things in terms of a log, but horribly inefficient. So there are many problems in terms of performance that we've so far ignored, where clients have to download the whole log from the server, clients have to sign the whole log, they have to upload the whole thing back. Ah, it seems really hard to pull off any performance system in that design. So how do you avoid this log growth? Or how do you get performance without these problems in our straw man? So let me try to explain. So this is basically, this is the second and third design that the paper presents. The first design the paper presents is the straw man that we've mostly gone over at this point. And then there are sort of two refinements that the paper presents. One that avoids the growth of the log. So log doesn't keep getting bigger and bigger and slower and slower. And the other is something about concurrency. We're not gonna have time to talk about the concurrent part of it, but hopefully we'll at least describe this uh, optimization ideas for avoiding log growth. So what's going on in Sunder, just to remind you, maybe in a slightly different uh, shape, uh, so that we can talk about how to do optimizations is that we got this log in the server and it has a bunch of operations from different users. So here, user A might log an operation, user A logs another operation, then maybe user B logs the third operation, then user A logs another one, B logs the fifth operation, and so on. And the problems that we'd like to tackle are twofold. First, in the straw man design so far, we gotta check all these signatures in the log every time we wanna do something. So we gotta check this signature and this and this and this and this and this. That seems kind of painful. And for that, we have to actually download the whole log as well. Another problem is we actually gotta interpret the log. So there was this crazy operation that I was drawing early on in the straw man where every time you wanna do anything with the file system, you download the whole log and you reconstruct the file system from the beginning of time applying all these operations one by one. Also, it gets slower and slower as we keep running. 
So there's sort of, you can think of sort of three logical steps that get us to be a, that get us a more efficient design here. So our first insight is that it actually suffices. You don't have to check all the signatures. It's okay to check just the last signature per user. So what I mean by this is that if we have this history over here, then we don't actually need to check the signature here. And we, need, we don't need to check the signature here. We just need to check the signature over here. So the last thing that A did, we got to check that signature. But all the previous things from A actually turns out to be subsumed by this signature. And the reason is that A's signature, like every signature, covers the whole prefix of the log. And that means that A must have seen A2 and A1 when it was signing A4. And because it's a presumably honest client, that means it would have checked its own signature or made sure this is a valid operation from A. So because A did that, we don't need to recheck it. If A wanted to lie, it could lie all kinds of ways. But if A is honest, then checking its signature here means that all these operations are also well signed. Same thing for B. It suffices to check B's signature over here. And that implicitly or transitively tells us that this operation from B also was okay. It's important to check every user's signature, of course. So it would be bad if we checked B's signature over here and wrongly assumed that that meant A's signature was okay. So an honest B would probably check A's signature and wouldn't sign it, wouldn't sign his B5 if A4 was missigned. But B might be a colluding user. So we can't really assume that the users are all good, but we can assume that each user is good with respect to its own previous changes. All right, so the first sort of insight on the way to optimizing Sunder is to realize that it's okay to check just the last operation from any given user. And the second thing we're gonna do is that instead of keeping track of the log of all operations that ever happened in the past, we're gonna flip the file system around and really break up the state by user. So we're gonna partition or shard the whole file system state per writer, if you will. So you know, traditionally you might think of a file system as having a directory and being structured along the file system tree in the hierarchy, the root directory, subdirectories, files, etc. Well, here we're gonna think of the file system in a very different way. We're gonna slice it up based on who wrote the data. So we have the part of the file system that B wrote, and then we'll have the part of the file system that A wrote. And if we take all the parts that every user wrote, well, we got ourselves the whole file system. And then the last thing sort of insight here to get more efficiency is that we're gonna sign a snapshot of each user's partition. Maybe instead of each, really, it's like the user. So every time you upload an operation into this log, where you used to put your operation and your ID and your signature, now you're gonna put a snapshot of your slice of the file system state into your operation. So let me describe this in a little bit more detail. This is figure two from the paper that describes their actual data structures. Um, so any questions about this sort of overall plan before we jump into the figure two design here? All right, so let's see what's gonna go. What are these per writer partitions gonna look like? And what is it that we're sticking in the log now instead of the operation that we were thinking about before? So here's what this plan is gonna look like. On the, so we're gonna construct the whole file system state, but we're gonna you know, slice it up in this slightly unusual way by who wrote the data. So on the right side, of, we'll have you know, the usual file data. So we'll have some data blocks over here. And then we have, of course, directory data. This is the contents of a directory in Sunder. 
On top of these data blocks that contain the payload of the file and the payload of the directory, we're going to have these inode objects. That's the logical thing. Uh, I guess I should say this is a data block. So this is you know just like four kilobytes or eight kilobytes of a file. It's not the whole file yet. Same for directory. It's just eight kilobytes out of a directory. And then to put it all into a single logical file or directory, we have this inode data structure, which has pointers to all the data blocks that comprise this file. And the way that Sunder implements these pointers is by including a hash of the block to which it's pointing in the inode. So here is, here is H0 and H1, and H0 is a cryptographic hash of this data block, and H1 is a cryptographic hash of this other data block. And the cool thing about this hash is that because it's a cryptographic collision resistant hash, knowing the hash means that the server shouldn't be able to cook up some fake contents that happens to have the same hash as what you have. The server just doesn't have that computational capability because the hash is a cryptographically collision resistant one. And same thing for a directory. We'll have you know, some inode for a directory that contains the hash of the data block for that directory. So, so far, this looks like a pretty standard Unix-like file system you might remember from 6033. Here's where things get weird or get split by user, which is that instead of having a global table of all the inodes in the system, we're going to have per user inode tables. So here we have A's I table, and it is just an array that says A's inode 5 is this inode. And it also names the inode by the hash of the inode data. And A's inode 6 is actually this directory. It also gets named by the hash of that inode. And then there is sort of, you know, the last level of hashing is what they call the I handle. And this is basically just a hash of a user's I table. So this is A's I handle. And the cool thing about hashes is they're pretty compact. So A's I handle is, you know, a 256 bit hash. I guess in the paper it's SHA-1, so 160 bits, but these days you'd probably use 256 bits of a hash. And that 256 bit hash value cryptographically commits you to all the state. Now there's no way, if you know this hash, there's no way a server could fool you and give you fake contents for any of these other blocks on the right. And then here's sort of the last clever part, which is that the directory entry in Sunder maps things to particular inode. So for example, in this directory, there's a file called foo. Traditionally, you'd map it to an inode number. In Sunder, you actually map it to a user and an inode number. So here, foo in this directory might be a's inode 5. So if you want to look up foo, then you go to a's inode table and grab 5. So this means this file is actually the file foo in this directory. And then you might have another file, bar, which might be b's third inode. So if you want to read bar, you've got to find b's i handle, look up its i table, find the third slot, go to that inode in b's table, and then you got the file. So this is the data structure that Sundra maintains. And now what's going on in these log entries is that we're going to write these i handles. Instead of writing the operation, this will just say, oh yeah, here's ih of b. That's the log entry, roughly speaking. And here's ih of a. So the log now consists of every user just saying, oh yeah, now I modified my state to be this. And then b says, oh yeah, now I modified my state to be this. And then at every point, you have a snapshot of the whole file system if you collect every user's most recent I handle. That makes sense? Questions? So this I handle plan is pretty cool because it allows us to avoid this log growth. If you want to access the file system, all you need is just every user's most recent I handle. And then there's basically one more clever trick that I'll describe briefly here, which is this idea of version vectors. So this is the 
clever way that Thunder avoids having to store the whole log, but still ensures fork consistency. So these version vectors, so one thing you might notice, right, is that when we have these I handles, we don't, we are sort of back to this really naive straw man I proposed at the beginning of lecture, where you don't know if you have the right or the most recent file system state from A's perspective and from B's perspective. How do you know you got the most recent I handle for A and B? So these version vectors are the answer, version vectors. So a version vector is basically a dictionary you can think of it. It maps a given user to how many changes have you seen from that user. So it might be the case that the version vector here is that, oh yeah, A made two changes and B made one change. That's a version vector. And it turns out that it suffices to basically just stick this version vector in these I handle entries. So just accessing the I handle doesn't tell you if you're seeing a consistent snapshot. But what works well is if every I handle is paired with the version vector from the perspective of the user that is supplying the I handle. So here, the version vector would be A has made three changes and B made one change. And this whole thing is signed by A. That's the version structure that the paper talks about. And then for B, the next version vector is, I saw all of A's three changes, and now there's two changes from B. That's the version vector for B. And this thing is signed by B. That's the version structure for B. And it turns out that if you have every user's version structure, and you check that all these version vectors are ordered in some way, there's no divergence in the version vectors, you can avoid for consistency. So hopefully this gives you at least a sense of what's going on. The paper has all the details about this, um, but uh, maybe the summary I'll try to leave you guys with is that this is a really hard problem that we're solving in Sunder or that the authors of the Sunder paper are solving. Uh, so trying to maintain this sort of strong level of integrity despite Byzantine servers, is really tricky and it's tricky in particular for a file system that has complicated structure and there's sort of two big classes of ideas here one is think of everything in terms of a log that really simplifies and clarifies your thinking as to how to get consistency guarantees because a log is easy you just append and what we saw in the paper is this notion of fork consistency which is pretty much inevitable in a lot of distributed systems but it's a pretty strong guarantee nonetheless and uh, a useful one to sort of keep in the back of your mind. And then the second sort of class of things the paper talks about is a bunch of techniques about these authenticated data structures, if you will, this how, the way we construct these I handles by repeatedly hashing various parts of a data structure are another clever trick that you see often used in decentralized systems and other systems that don't want to trust a, uh, server of some kind. All right, so hopefully it gives you a, some appreciation for the Sunder thing. Um, it's a pretty widely used set of techniques that you'll see in you know, blockchains, as I mentioned, and other decentralized systems. Um, and uh, that wraps up this lecture. Uh, sorry for running over a little bit. Thanks for sticking around. Um, you guys can disconnect if you want, uh, but I'm happy to entertain questions after the lecture is over, so to say, uh, if you have more questions. I have a quick question. Um, so what if every user but one user colludes with the server, then I think you could break this uh, security here. So the scenario you're describing is basically, I, you know, we got a group of 10 buddies here and I'm one of the 10 buddies and then there's nine other people here. All those nine other people and the server are out to get me. Could happen. <laughs> Uh, but uh, what Sunder guarantees in this case, okay, so let's first think about what could we even expect? So I am one of the users and there's nine other users I'm sharing with and all those nine other users are out to get me. Well, I shouldn't expect a whole lot because any file that those other users can write, they could write garbage themselves. They almost don't need the server to collude. They could just write the garbage directly into the shared file because they are the buddies I'm sharing with and maybe my initial trust was misplaced in them. So there's, there's not a whole lot you can expect if 
all the other users of the system are out to get you. That said, there is still a property that Sunder guarantees, which is that my own changes in the file system will be correctly ordered. So if there's some file in the file system that only I have access to, if only, if I am the only owner of a particular file in a Sunder file system, then the server and the other colluding users can never corrupt this file because they can never present a signature saying it was correctly modified by me. And they can't roll back my own changes because I will always expect the server to serve me back a history that contains my own changes in it. I'm describing this in terms of the straw man design that we talked about earlier on, just because it's a little bit trickier to describe the same thing couched in terms of version vectors and I handles. But the same sort of reasoning applies. Makes sense. Thanks. Sure. Other questions? I'm a bit confused about on the log optimization point one, where you only have to check each user's last signature. Yeah. The same user, if one user is bad and colludes with the server for whatever reason, and they send three updates in a row, they could have the first two be malicious and then the last one be verified. Maybe I'm misunderstanding this, but. So it's true. It. Okay, so, so the, I think the scenario you're describing is, um, you know, one of the users with access to our shared folder is a bad guy. And uh, he issues, as you described, three updates. The first two, he doesn't sign correctly. The last one, he does sign correctly. So it's true that my optimization here that says you only have to check the last signature will miss the fact that the previous two updates were not correctly signed. But it's not like this gives the bad guy any more power. He could have correctly signed those first two updates. He has the private key. He could have signed it if he wanted to. He didn't, but it's not like he can do anything more as a result because it still must be the case that whatever change he performed in those previous updates in the history, even though they weren't correctly signed, they must have come from his public key and then we'll check that that public key of the bad guy is allowed to modify that file. If he's allowed, that's fine. And he could have correctly signed it and just done it that way. He didn't have to jump through this weird hoop. Makes sense, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? I, I have some questions, but it's not, it's, it's more about our project. So I just, I, I don't wanna, I wanna make sure everyone who has a question about the lecture can ask first. All right, sounds good, yeah. Maybe, uh, actually, if you wanna send us email, we're gonna chat with actually a couple of students after this lecture anyway about final projects. So uh, just like post on Piazza or send us mail and then we'll like set up a separate Zoom thing with you right after this to sync up about the project. Okay, well, I'll send you an email right now. Thanks, yeah. All right. If there's no other questions, I guess we'll wrap this up and uh, see you guys on Monday. We'll talk about side channels and modern CPU architectures. See you then.